Good afternoon. My name is Joan Reed, Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School and president of the Biomedical Science Careers Program. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us uh, for today's program, Getting Into Health Professional School and Succeeding. We have more than 280 individuals who've registered, and this includes students from across our country. Uh, there's a wonderful panel joining us today with representatives from the fields of nursing, physical and occupational therapies, dentistry, and physician assistant studies and pharmacy. A little bit about the SCP. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the Biomedical Science Careers Program, and the mission of BSCP is to provide students of every race, ethnic background, gender, and financial status with the encouragement, support, and guidance needed for the successful pursuit of biomedical science and other science health-related careers. The primary objective of all BSCP activities is to identify, inform, support, and provide mentoring for academically outstanding students and fellows, particularly underrepresented and disadvantaged individuals. Since its inception in 1991, more than 13,000 minority students and 1,200 underrepresented postdoctoral trainees and junior faculty members have participated in BSCP programs. Participants range from high school to postdoctoral level and take part from institutions across this country. A little housekeeping items before we begin. All lines will be muted and the chat function has been disabled. So please communicate via the question and answer the Q&A tab in your webinar panel. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Webinar recordings will be available on the BSCP website. And uh, at the end, there's going to be some poll questions, very quick, very fast, but it helps us to understand what your needs are and um, how well we have or have not done in terms of preparing this for you. I'm gonna now turn this over to our moderator for today's program, and that's Dr. Raphael Luna, who's an Associate Dean at the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and Director of the Boston College Pre-Health Program and also Director of the Gateway Scholars Program in STEM at Boston College. Dr. Luna is a member of the BSCP Board of Directors, a BSCP Student Advisor, and a member of the Planning Committee for the New England Science Symposium. And importantly, he is also a former BSCP student. Dr. Luna? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Reed, and thank you for your kind words and for your leadership in the biomedical field, especially during these trying times. Um, and I, what I would like to do is uh, start with, you know, providing a little bit of the format, what we'll do today. Um, I will introduce the panelists, and then afterwards, we'll open up with two questions that each panelist will answer to give a better understanding of their particular field. This will be followed up by questions from the Q&A tab. So please remember to submit short, clear questions and we will do our best to answer them. So first, uh, as our wonderful panelists, we have an amazing panelist today, I'm so excited. And so uh, we, we have Dr. Alyssa Harris. She's the Associate Professor and Department Chair as well as the Director of the Women's Health Nurse Practitioner Program at the William F. Connell School of Nursing at Boston College and she is a B BSCP student advisor. Then we have Dr. Elise Townsend. She's an associate professor and admissions chair in the Department of Physical Therapy and associate director of the PhD program in Rehabilitation Sciences in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the Massachusetts General uh, Hospital Institutes of Health Professions. And then we have Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos, uh, she is the Director of Admissions at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. And we have Ms. Mary Warner, and she is the Founding Director of the Physician Assistant Program at Boston University School of Medicine. She is a BSCP student advisor as well. And we have Dr. David Zagarek, and he is a Professor of Pharmacy in the Department of Pharmacy and Health Sciences within the School of Pharmacy at Bouvet College of Health Sciences at Northeastern University. And he is a BSCP student advisor as well. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, start with 
um, asking each panelist to give, to give us in the audience uh, a brief overview of the scope of their fields. We have a, a very a diverse field of uh, areas um, of specialties in the, um, in, the bio, in the biomedical space. So we want you to comment on that. And we'll ask, um, and as each panelist speaks, a slide with resources will be shown from their respective institution and fields. And we encourage the students to screenshot the slide for future reference. So Dr. Harris, let's start with you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am a nurse um, and nursing is both an art and a science. Um, nurses, registered nurses are licensed healthcare professionals. We take care of um, individuals um, biological, physical, and behavioral needs. And this ex care extends not just um, to the person, but to the family and the community. Some key responsibilities of nurses are physical exams, health histories, health promotion and education, administering medication and treatments, and assisting in coordination of patient care services. Um, so that's a registered nurse. An advanced practice nurse or a nurse practitioner is somebody who holds an advanced degree in nursing, somebody who could be um, have a master's degree or higher, and they encompass those, those, those key roles I said initially, but also um, they may diagnose and treat medical conditions in an office. And so those are the major um, kind of specialties within nursing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And next uh, we have Dr. Elise Townsend. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a physical therapist by training, but I'm here today to represent both the fields and teach you a little bit about both physical and occupational therapy field uh, careers. We often work collaboratively together and there's an interesting kinds of overlap between our different fields. So physical therapists are really their expertise lies in movement, in the human movement system. And they apply their knowledge, or we apply our knowledge as movement experts to improve the quality of life for patients through exercise, through hands-on care, and through patient education. Um, occupational therapists, as opposed to their expertise being in movement, their expertise is really in occupation, which they define as daily activities. So they um, they help patients be able to live their lives, both the living part and the working part, and train and teach um, patients how to uh, care for themselves so that they can optimize their participation in life. Um, so we're both interested in quality of life and participation, but we kind of come at the, the care of the patient from slightly different, um, different lenses. We work in all different kinds of practice settings, schools for children, um, skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, rehab centers, outpatient clinics, including sports medicine clinics. And so um, the, you know, the age range of patients that we see goes from birth all the way through senescence and the different practice er uh, locations that you can find physical and occupational therapists um, vary widely as well. Th thank you very much, Dr. Townsend. And now we have Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos. Sorry for getting to unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Um, so a, a dentist is a doctor, scientist, and clinician who is dedicated to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of oral diseases and conditions. Dentists play a key role in the detection of oral cancer and other conditions of the body that first appear in the mouth. At uh, Harvard School of Dental Medicine, or HSDM as we call ourselves, uh, we consider dentistry a specialty of medicine because the mouth is part of the body. It's not a mouth on a stick. A dentist evaluates the overall health of their patients and advises them about oral health and disease prevention. They perform clinical procedures such as exams, fillings, crowns, implants, extractions, and corrective surgeries. And they work to diagnose, identify, diagnose, and treat oral conditions. Um, a dentist may choose to perform general dentistry once they graduate from um, dental school, or they may decide to go on to uh, for additional schooling and specialize in one of nine recognized dental specialties. With population growth, changes in healthcare law, and the upcoming retirement of a large group of people, the need for new dentists is rapidly increasing. 
U.S. News and World Report actually rate, rates dentistry uh, number one in best healthcare jobs, number two out of 100 best jobs, and number two in best STEM jobs. You might be interested to know that the most common personality traits of a dentist include being detail-oriented, artistic, a leader, trustworthy, easy to talk to, and comfortable working in close quarters because the mouth is a really small space. Um, in the United States, the nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association that you may choose to pursue after dental school include dental public health, which is a non-clinical specialty of dentistry that deals with the prevention of oral disease and promotion of oral health in populations, endodontics, a specialist who diagnoses and treats tooth pain and performs root canal treatment, maybe some of you have had a root canal, not too fun. Oral and maxillofacial pathology, which studies diseases of the mouth and other structure. Oral and maxillofacial radiology, which is concerned with the performance and interpretation of x-rays that are used, uh, that are taken of the head and other uh, parts of the head. And oral and maxillofacial surgery specialists are frequently referred to as oral surgeons. You may have seen an oral surgeon to have your wisdom teeth taken out like I did. Uh, the sixth specialty is orthodontics, which treats irregularities in the teeth and the jaws. Some of you may have seen an orthodontics for uh, braces or a, a palate expander. Pediatric dentistry, who works with children. Periodontology, which focuses more on the structures, um, the supporting structures that, of the teeth, like the gums. And then finally, prosthodontics, we have um, the branch of dentistry concerned with construction of artificial appliances, such as, such as fake teeth. And those are the nine, the nine specialty areas. Thank you. Thank you for that great um, introduction as well to, your, to, your, uh, to the field of dentistry. Now we have Ms. Mary Warner. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm glad to be with you uh, virtually. Um, I prefer always meeting in person, but this is the best we can do for now. Um, so I'm a physician assistant by training, and as you know, I um, started the PA program at Boston University, and I've been a PA educator for about 20 years. So physician assistant started um, as a profession in 1965, um, when lots of returning veterans came back from the Korean War, and, and then in the 70s, the Vietnam War, and were trained um, to provide care with um, uh, collaboration with physicians. So we work in a team-based approach where uh, we see our own patients, but we take care of patients as a part of the team. So we work very closely with other members of the team, such as the physicians, nurse practitioners, if they're working on the team, nursing and so um, uh, RNs and so on. And um, the specialties that PAs work in um, range widely. Um, probably the specialty that's least uh, common is actually women's health. And it's not because you can't work in that specialty, but there are lots of um, wonderful nurses who are midwives who often are, are um, working in women's health. And so there's just not as much opportunity. Although if you're interested, you can do that. Um, but PAs work in primary care um, and in, in specialties in medicine like cardiology and pulmonary medicine and critical care in the ICU settings. Um, we also work in surgery, orthopedic surgery is very common, emergency medicine. Um, so there's a, a lot of different opportunities. Um, we also are a little bit different than other special other uh, professions because you can change specialties. You're trained as a generalist, which means that you've learned a lot about um, lot, or a little bit about lots of things. And then when you go and work in different specialties, you get some more on the job training. Um, there are some residency programs available if one is interested, although it's not a very popular option at this point. About 4% of PAs end up doing a residency program. Um, so uh, that's sort of, in a nutshell, what um, some overview of the profession. In terms of what the PA does on a day-to-day -day basis, if you're working in a medicine or an outpatient clinic setting, um, you're going to be seeing patients, taking a history, doing a physical exam, um, prescribing medications, and following up with the patient as needed. Um, obviously, in the virtual environment, many PAs are working um, in the telehealth uh, environment with COVID at this point. Um, if you're in the surgical environment, you're probably going to be working in a hospital setting 
where you would round on the patients in the morning, check on them, then go to surgery, then come back and um, take care of wounds and, and the patients. And, and you might end up even um, seeing some patients in a clinic setting. So those are sort of the general day-to-day um, -day activities that a lot of PAs do. Um, PAs also work in public health, they work in education, um, and there are definitely um, a growing number of PA researchers who are interested in workforce and policy research. And um, so there's a, a lot of different opportunities um, within the profession. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Warner. We really appreciate very on that. Um, and now uh, we go to Dr. David Zagari. Thank you so much, Dr. Luna, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, I'm here to talk about pharmacy. I'm very proud to be a pharmacist. I've been a pharmacist for over 30 years, and that career path has taken me to places that I would have never imagined it was going to take me when I, when I started my uh, forays into pharmacy while I was still in high school. Um, in terms of what pharmacists do, they are the health professionals that are responsible for the safe and effective use of medications. And we use medications in so many different ways in health and healthcare. Um, pharmacy is the third largest health profession behind only nursing and medicine. There are over 300,000 pharmacists in the United States today. About half of those pharmacists work in settings that you likely are all familiar with, the, the community pharmacies that we see um, throughout uh, our neighborhoods. Pharmacists are amongst the most accessible of healthcare professionals. People know that if they have an issue, problem, not just about medications, but about their health in general, that, that a knowledgeable pharmacist is close by and is accessible to them, that they can ask. And that's one of the key roles of that community pharmacist is that triage function, being able to answer questions, point people in directions where they can get the most appropriate levels of care. Community pharmacists have had a really important impact, particularly as we are dealing with the COVID situation and other aspects today. Again, at that accessibility means that there are more people coming to them uh, with more questions and more help than ever before. The other pharmacists work in settings such as hospitals, clinics, government agencies, part of the pharmaceutical industry with training that essentially goes along the lines that, that physicians receive in terms of all the different specialty areas. As you can imagine, any different specialty that utilizes medications, a, a pharmacist is there and can be there to, to utilize their training and to help the rest of the team get the most of, of utilizing medications. Uh, pharmacists pursue postgraduate residencies and fellowships now upwards of 50% of pharmacists will, will actually do a postgraduate uh, residency or fellowship in addition to the doctor or pharmacy degree. Um, there's also a research path for pharmacists. Um, not everybody in a, within a pharmacy school or with a pharmacy background necessarily goes into clinical practice. Uh, there are about a number of people, including people like myself, that pursue research as a career. Uh, we discover new medicines. We look at learning new ways about how medications work. Uh, we learn about the impact of medications on our bodies, and we learn about the impact of, of medications in our societies, and we work hand-in-hand -hand with other healthcare professionals to be able to do that. Oh, great. Thank you so very much, Dr. Zagarek, for that the wonderful um uh, introduction to the to your field, and so this is great. This is really exciting. There's already a lot of great information going on, and so um, I would like to direct the next question to each panelist as well. Can each one of you please briefly provide information to your uh, uh, specific uh, to your uh, information specific to your discipline, along with what students would need to know in order to successfully apply to a program in your field, um, particularly. Would you also be able to comment on whether you need a specific major to, to go into your field? And if so, it's BA or BS um, as well. Could you provide a little clarity on that? We noticed that came in on the, the Q&A, so we want to be attentive to that as well. So thank you again. And we'll start off again the same way, alphabetical order, with Dr. Alyssa Harris. So um, to specifically apply to nursing school, there are two ways in which to apply. So if you're a high school student, looking to become a registered nurse, you would apply to any um, bachelor's prepared nursing program. Um, there are 
the particular prerequisites are just to have good um, SAT scores and good um, um, math and science scores. If you are already a registered nurse, then you can apply to any master's or doctoral program in nursing. Um, and you don't particularly, some schools require GREs, others don't. Um, but if you have the undergraduate nursing degree, then applying to a master's program with no particular special um, prerequisites are required other than your nursing degree. So there's another pathway into um, being a nurse or nurse practitioner. You can be, um, um, have a degree in another field, a BS or BA in another field, and apply to what we call direct entry programs. Those are for individuals who have a degree in another field, would like to enter nursing, um, or to be a nurse practitioner, either be a, a, just a regular registered nurse or a nurse practitioner. They have specific um, requirements for those, and usually those include statistics, anatomy and physiology, microbiology, some of the science degrees. Um, and so there, there are specific programs across the country that have these direct entry programs that you can apply to to be a nurse practitioner. If you, you want to have a, a, a degree in a different specialty and just be a registered nurse, there are accelerated bachelor nursing programs that you would need to apply for. And those programs are kind of shorter than the, long, the normal four-year bachelor prepare programs or shorter condensed programs. And you need additional prerequisites, including GRE, statistics, anatomy and physiology, and microbiology to apply to those programs. And I think those are for nursing. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Dr. Harris. And um, Dr. Townsend, um, would you mind commenting as well? Sure, I can speak to physical and occupational therapy. So there are slight differences between physical and occupational therapy in terms of entrance requirements, but in general, um, for physical therapy, both require a bachelor's degree, either a BS or a BA. Um, the good news is, is that your, your undergraduate major can be in just about anything um, for applying to physical and occupational therapy school. Some of the most common majors of our applicants are anything in the health sciences, biology, psychology, sociology, exercise science, neuroscience, education, but we even have dance majors and business majors who apply to our PT program every year. Um, because we, you know, we really welcome the diversity of lots of different undergrad majors and backgrounds, and what that means is we do need to sort of have prerequisites to make sure that the students coming in have a solid foundation in the kinds of sciences that they need to begin work at the graduate level. And so um, some of the common prerequisites, it, the prerequisites unfortunately vary a little bit across the country, although in the last five to 10 years, they've done a good job of trying to kind of focus in on um, a common set of prerequisites for most PT and OT programs. But common prerequisites are biology, anatomy and physiology, statistics, human development, social sciences, um, for physical therapy, they require some chemistry and physics um, are also typical. So um, you'll, you'll need to check the programs that you might be interested in to see what their specific prerequisites are, but that gives you at least a little bit of an idea of, of what to expect. Um, for applying to PT and OT programs, most or many physical and occupational therapy programs use a centralized application system, which means that nationwide you go to, for physical therapy, it's called PTCAS. And you can apply to most of the programs that you would want to apply to through that centralized application system. That's been a wonderful thing that's kind of come forth in the field in the last uh, 10 years or so, so that students don't have to make very different applications to different programs. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, um, and now we have um, uh, Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos. Hi again. Um, so applicants for dental school can major in any area provided that they complete the prerequisite requirements, which are similar um, among dental schools, but not always exactly the same. They include sciences such as organic chemistry, um, biology, general chemistry, um, some math, some English courses. The admissions process really begins when you first decide to become a dentist. Um, the process involves researching the profession in dental schools, meeting with the pre-health advisor, completing your prerequisite courses, engaging in extracurricular activities, and spending time shadowing a dentist uh, and hopefully other specialists to learn more about the profession. Um, individuals planning to apply to dental school should do so one year before they 
before they're going to enter the program. So students applying now um, to dental school will enter um, Harvard School of Dental Medicine's program next August 2021. The admissions process involves three key components. The first one is taking the dental admissions test, or some people call it the DAT. Uh, and many students take some sort of dental prep course, such as DAT boot camp, um, to get ready for it. Um, others use prep books, and there are many resources available online. The sections of the DAT include survey of natural sciences, perceptual ability, reading comprehension, and quantitative reasoning. And each section is scored on a scale of 1 to 30, and you register for the DAT through the ABA website. To, to apply to most dental schools in the U.S., you have to apply using the IDEA ADSAS application. The ADSAS stands for, um, oh, I have that a little further down, sorry. Um, and the um, application is, is common among all schools except uh, Texas. Some Texas residents who wish to apply to dental schools in Texas will use a, a separate application system. And then the third component is additional requirements um, that need to be submitted to each dental school, and these can vary. Many schools require a supplemental or a secondary application once you've applied, and this is in addition to the ADSAS application. Usually there's a secondary application fee um, that varies from school to school. At HSDM, the fee is $80, but we waive this if you're a member of the Armed Forces or if you qualify for the Fee Assistance Program, the FAP, that's offered through IDEA. And most schools will also waive their application fees if you, uh, if you qualify for the FAP. After you've submitted, you've submitted your completed applications, you should begin to prepare for interviews. Um, in preparing for your interviews, it's important to, to spend time finding out about yourself and about the dental schools that may be the best fit for you. Contact the schools, ask questions, speak with alums if you can. IDEA Go Dental, um, and so there's a link to that in my slide, serves as a tremendous resource for information. Um, there's also an IDEA Pre-Dental Student Virtual Fair each, each spring where you can interact with representatives of dental schools from across the country that is excellent. Most dental schools require an interview to be considered for admission, and the process and timing varies. They might be one-on-one uh, -on -one group or uh, multi multiple mini interviews. Um, at HSDM, for example, you will meet with two members of the admissions committee for two one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversational interviews that last about 45 minutes. Most dental schools have moved to virtual interviews for fall uh, and are in the process of figuring out what that's going to look like. Um, but regardless of the interview format, make sure to be on time, to dress professionally, to look at the camera, uh, eye contact as much as possible, which is challenging, and to have questions prepared that will help you decide if the program is a good match for you. Also, to make sure to send in a thank you note. In terms of COVID-19, um, IDEA is hosting a web page for dental schools to post application process changes, and there's a link to that in my slide. Um, make sure to check back frequently because things are evolving quickly and um, like they will likely change throughout the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate that great insight. And now we have Ms. Uh, Mary Warner. Hello again. Um, so I would um, like to say that for PAs, um, this is becoming a very um, competitive uh, specialty or um, career. Um, there's about almost 30,000 people applying to PA school and there's about 8,000 slots. So one thing that I always like to tell students right off the bat is that you may need to apply more than once and that is not a problem. There are many, many people who have to apply more than once. Um, and there's some kind of interesting quirks about the PA profession that I'll share with you. So one thing that is very common, which I think it sounds like um, many of the other uh, professions have, is we have a centralized application service, which is called CASPA, which is the centralized application for um, uh, PA um, programs. And um, once you complete that application, it requires you to have all of your um, prerequisites put in, you have to add your transcript and your letters of recommendation, referrals, and, um, and then also your essay about why you want to be a PA. There's opportunities to share your experiences in healthcare. Um, most PA programs 
um, have a variety, which I think is similar to the dental schools and, and OT and PT and maybe nursing as well, um, where you have to look at the website to see what the prerequisites are. Um, there are different ones depending on the program. And um, most of the prerequisite differences relate to whether or not you need to have organic chemistry, um, whether or not you need to have advanced um, psychology classes, and it just depends on the program. So it's important to take a look at that. And if you look at the website um, that I listed on the references, um, which is the Physician Assistant Education Association online website, there's actually a program um, uh, directory that you can look at and decide which places you might be interested in geographically, but also what the prerequisite requirements are. Um, prior to COVID-19, most programs did require a GRE. Um, now that COVID-19 has occurred, most programs have opted not to have the GRE as a requirement. And so, um, like the others panelists, the advice is please look at the websites to see what's going on because it is a fluid situation and I suspect it's gonna change even more. Um, and programs that are deciding to not have it might decide they wanna have it again. So it's important to, to be sort of prepared on all levels. Um, in order to apply to PA school, there's two ways to um, enter the profession. One is by starting as an 18 year old in an undergraduate program that is a, a six year program. Typically, sometimes they're five and a half years um, where you start as an undergraduate and you um, work your way through the prerequisites and then you start the, the um, PA part of the degree and finish up um, at the end. And I think there's about 20 or so programs that have that as an option. And then ma the majority of programs are um, master's degree granting programs. Um, and there are a few programs that are offering um, some sort of add-on degree for a doctoral degree as well. But most programs are master's degree programs, so you have to have a bachelor's degree when you start. Um, specific to the PA profession, um, there are a lot of programs that require you to have a lot of um, clinical experience, and some programs have very strict rules about what that means. So if you were a nursing assistant, that might um, satisfy some, some requirements. If you're a phlebotomist, it might not. So you need to look at the individual websites, and if you have any questions about your previous experience, uh, and how it might relate to you being admitted, I would contact individual um, programs one by one to make sure that what you've done to prepare um, is adequate. Most programs, after you apply, um, they'll invite you to a supplemental application, and um, those are tend to be essays and further information that's gathered about your previous experience in life, whether it has to do with medicine or not. And I would say that um, like many of the other professions, you don't have to have a pre-med um, degree. You need to have the pre-med pre requisites or um, the pre-PA uh, prerequisites. They're very similar to one another. Um, but beyond that, um, we have people who are English majors and history majors and political science majors as well. Um, and sometimes we have actors that come back to school um, and decide they wanna be a PA. Um, some schools require you to shadow PAs in advance. Um, that requirement has pretty much gone by the wayside with COVID-19. Um, it may or may not come back. It's, it's something that um, started early on in the profession and has more historical context than maybe actual value. Um, but no matter what, if you're invited for an interview, you wanna be sure that you're prepared and that you know what a PA is and how it may be the same or different than other professions and why this profession seems to suit you and fits you well. Um, so those are important interview sort of tips. Um, most of the interviews, I'm sure, are going to be online, um, and, and that's what's happened um, for the first part of the year for schools that we're interviewing in March and April. Um, and um, so that's something that you should prepare for. And I agree with um, Sarah in terms of um, trying to be in a quiet location, addressing uh, dressing pr appropriately, and sort of practicing a little bit um, with looking at the camera, because I think it is a little hard to do that. Um, so uh, I think 
that I've covered most of how to get into a PA program. I do want to emphasize that um, the CASPA and the programs have um, fee waivers for programs uh, for individuals who meet the um, uh, minimums in terms of um, ability to pay. We don't want to turn anyone away, so um, feel free to ask for that um, extra help because if you apply to 10 or 15 programs, it can be quite expensive, um, you know, more than $100 per program. So it's really helpful if, if you take advantage of that, if you need it. Um, and I think that's about it. I would say one other piece of advice with regard to COVID-19 is that um, a lot of programs that, uh, well, all PE programs were um, traditional programs that you were in residence. Um, we had one program, the Yale Online program, um, that started two or three years ago, I guess, and um, they were providing some of their curriculum online. Now all PE programs are, are um, having a lot of their didactic curriculum, which is the sort of the classroom curriculum online. Um, and so you're gonna need to um, have a little more flexibility maybe than what we would <laughs> normally ask of you um, because if there's another wave in October, programs are planning about how to handle that and it depends on where you're located. As you know, we had a big, um, uh, wave in Boston and, and New York and things are settling down there but now in Arizona and Texas it's very busy so you have to sort of be prepared for um, learning however it is that you can um, so that's all I'll say for now thank you so very much that's great um, and now uh, Dr. David Zagari all right thanks Dr. Luna uh, just a little bit about getting into pharmacy programs and, and pursuing a doctor of pharmacy degree. Um, the doctor of pharmacy degree is the entry level degree that, that pharmacists have when they go into practice today. There are about 144 schools of pharmacy nationally. Um, in most cases, the pathway to the doctor of pharmacy degree is a four year professional degree, like many of the other clinical doctoral degrees. There are a handful of programs that uh, have an accelerated, essentially you go all year long, you, you can do it in as little as three years, most are set up as four year programs. Um, most, but not all programs are set this up as somewhat of a postgraduate degree or at least a degree that you have three to four years of classwork that it is pre required pre-pharmacy classwork, uh, which has a focus on things like the sciences, math, um, and especially an emphasis on communication skills and, and the social sciences these days. I mean, if we are helping people get the most of their medications, we have to be able to work with people. We have to be able to communicate with people. And so we take that communications very seriously. There are a small number of programs, including ours here at Northeastern, that does still offer a pathway into the Doctor of Pharmacy degrees to students that know they're interested straight out of high school. And you can come, you're, you're very much put into a program that, that gets you all those prerequisites that you would need um, and prepares you to enter the program. Those people can get the Doctor of Pharmacy degree in as little as six years. Um, but the, probably the more typical pathway these days is it taking seven to eight years. There, like most of the other programs you've heard about today, there is no particular major. Um, we do have an emphasis, as one might imagine, on, on the sciences, you know, chemistry, of course, biology, um, again, social sciences and so forth. Um, but that said, our, our students come to us in pharmacy from a very, very wide variety of majors and backgrounds, and, and we actually very much encourage that these days. Um, we have, like most other uh, of the programs you're hearing about today, we have a centralized admissions process. The vast majority of pharmacy schools participate in that centralized admissions process is called FarmCast. And as you apply to FarmCast, you'll find that it just makes it so much easier to be able to consider multiple pharmacy programs and, and consider multiple pharmacy programs when you um, want to think about what's the best fit for you. Um, as part of our accreditation requirements, every student who comes into a pharmacy program must participate in an interview. And while those interviews used to be face-to-face, -face, as you can imagine, the, one of the adaptions to COVID is very much like what we're doing right here. We've changed pretty much all of our interviews into um, these online interviews. I've actually participated in a number of these myself. I find that they're going very well. We can still do pretty much all of the things that we would expect 
to take place during our regular interviews. We actually use um, an MMI, a multiple mini, mini interview process. Um, not only, of course, do we want to learn about um, you and your background and perhaps have you had some experience working with pharmacists and other healthcare professionals, um, we, we also want to learn about your problem solving skills, about your communication skills, um, about your ability to kind of think on your feet. And, and, you know, there are certain things that we can do in that is particularly the MMI process that helps us get at that. Um, I think that's probably about it uh, in terms of what I can say right now. Um, I, I know we have many similarities with, with the other programs in terms of the, the type of student that we're looking for and, and what it takes to be successful once you're in pharmacy programs. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the program. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Zagarek. Um, and, and you brought up, um, we just had a question come in from the, um, uh, from the audience. And thank you, audience. You're asking great questions on the Q&A. So, you know, great, great job on that. Keep that up. We're, we're going through them. And we're trying to answer them either privately or also to get, bring to my attention as well. But Dr. Zagarek, since, you know, you, uh, you mentioned uh, Farmcast, we had a, a question that said specifically, is there a source where we can find out more detailed information about universities that offer PharmD programs? And you mentioned PharmCast, but could you provide more information on PharmCast? And are there any other areas that could complement PharmCast or just Certainly. someone that just doesn't have a, they're just now learning about pharmacy? What, what, they, what should they do when they type into Google? Certainly, uh, one thing I'll say, probably the best place to start a search would be uh, with the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, or uh, aacp.org. And that will provide you not only with some background information about pharmacy, but it'll link you to every single pharmacy school. It will link you to Farmcast so that you can learn more about that process. Um, it, it, it'll link you to some resources that, that the association has developed, particularly for students like yourselves who, who want to explore more about which, so what do pharmacists do? What are the options for me? What do I need to do to be able to prepare to go to pharmacy school? We make a lot of resources like that available to, to people that are interested in pharmacy and want to learn more about pharmacy. Um, so that, that would be a, a good place. I, and again, I think if you go back to the slides that had been uh, provided, all of that information is, is there on that slide, all those links. Thank you so much, Dr. Zagarek. And so um, we'll, we'll go back down in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, so now this question is for Dr. Elise Townsend. Um, are there any virtual observation hours, opportunities for physical therapy? And where can someone find them? Like, again, like if they're on Google, what do they type in or what do they look up or who do they call? Just uh, any insight on that would be greatly appreciated, Dr. Townsend. Sure, I have a couple of ideas and insight there. Um, at the MGH Institute of Health Professions, we did make the decision because of COVID this year to accept virtual observation hours. Um, and we keep our required observation hours really low because we know it's hard for students to get them. Um, so ours is just 10. And the reason we kept it at 10 is we really just want to make sure that you've done yourselves the service of observing a physical therapist at least long enough to realize that maybe this is or maybe this is not the right field for you. Um, so we try to keep it accessible in that way. And um, if, if virtual observation hours are, if a student has them and they've been verified by a physical therapist, we're going to count those this year, um, at least this year, probably from here to forward is what I imagine. The way to get them is, um, is the trickier part, right? And historically, it's always be, been find a friend, find someone you know, and that's not easy. So the American Physical Therapy Association has a website as well. And there's a, there's a, a feature embedded in that website that's called Find a PT. And you can go there, and whether you're a patient or a student, a prospective student, and you can use your zip code to type in and get a list of physical therapists that are near your zip code. Um, and from that, you can reach out and contact them. Um, I went to a blog that a prospective student put up recently that you could probably Google and find with advice about how, how students can get observation hours. And they said, you know, only about 5% of the time did they get a, get a response um, when, they, uh, when they sent an email to the physical therapist. 
but a higher percentage of response they got by um, the calling and asking and expressing interest that way. And an even higher percentage of response, they actually went to the office, sat, and said they'd be willing to wait as long as possible to talk to a physical therapist about possibly getting observation hours. So I think you have to have a little tenacity and creativity and, um, and be willing to kind of do what it takes to get yourself in front of a physical therapist and show them um, you know, your passion and your interest and make, make your case. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. That's great advice. So I hope all you uh, students out there, you know, there's the email is great, but, you know, pick up the phone, go to the office, sit down and be amenable. Um, so there, and, and just try as many approaches as possible. Thank you so much. That was really helpful, practical advice. Our, our next question is for Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos. Um, and we have a question for her. And a student says, I am currently a researcher who has worked very closely with infectious diseases and found in, my re in her research and readings that many of these diseases can appear in the oral cavity. Uh, I am interested in dentistry and I'm applying to dental school and would like to ask, how do you believe my research background would add value um, or not to my, not only to my application, but also to entering dental class? Sure, thanks for that question. Um, it sounds like your experience would make for a great, a great essay and certainly um, a memorable one. Um, some dental schools are more focused on the relationship between oral health and overall health than others. Um, Harvard is one of them, Columbia is another, where you actually spend your first year, at least at Harvard, in uh, medical school, at, at taking the foundational biomedical sciences, and basic sciences courses. So um, for an admissions office to see that you already understand that link um, can, can be very valuable to us. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it will give you something great to talk about um, during your application and, uh, and with interviews. And it also sounds like you might have found a path that, that would be, uh, have a good career for you. I hope that helps. Yes, that helps a lot. Thank you so very much. Um, and now we have a question uh, from Ms. Warner. Uh, it says, hi, I'm a rising senior interested in becoming a PA. Could you talk a little more about the opportunities within the PA profession? You mentioned that some PAs work in public health and education fields I'm also interested in. And then also we dovetail this with another question from the audience. As an aspiring PA, is it recommended to take a gap year to get more clinical experience? And thanks so much. Boy, I'm glad you didn't ask me to cure cancer in that question. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. Okay, so I'll start with the second one first. Um, actually, most students do take a gap year, at least one year and sometimes two years to get their, their experience. And I also think that, that um, a lot of students end up becoming scribes, although that's not the only way to do it. Um, a lot of students become nursing assistants. There's uh, EMTs, um, emergency medicine technicians. There's lots of different um, approaches. And I think that what I've seen is that when students do that, they're actually, they understand the context uh, in which care is delivered, and that makes it much easier for them to learn the material because they're not distracted by, the, by what's going on around them. They sort of feel comfortable already in that environment, if that makes sense. Um, so the first question was more about the profession, I think, is that, do I have that right, Dr. Luna? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, there are a lot of different options. Um, one thing that is true about the PA profession is about 85% of people who um, train as a PA actually are still practicing as a PA, which is very high compared with a lot of the other professions, which suggests that there's a lot of um, satisfaction in the role. And I think one of the reasons that we have uh, a lot of satisfaction in the role is that you can change specialties um, I myself worked in orthopedic surgery, I worked in cardiac surgery, and I worked in emergency medicine um, when I was practicing clinically. And then I became an educator and still continued to practice clinically for quite a long time, and then just sort of focused on education and research. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities, and I would say that in, in listening to the panelists, that seems to be true for all of these professions, meaning that 
Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can use your degree beyond um, healthcare if you decide you want to do that or um, something comes along. And PAs that work in public health do so alongside with nurses and uh, physicians and pharmacists and probably dentists as well. Um, we're, we have a good alignment with the, a dental school at BU um, on that topic, but um, global health is an option. Um, as I mentioned earlier, research is an option. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, move forward. Some PAs end up um, working for pharmaceutical companies um, and some of them um, are writing policy in Washington, D.C. So it, there's a wide range of opportunities. And I would, I'm not sure, I'm not going to speak for the other professions, but I think that's very similar within a lot of health professions, that there are a lot of different ways that you can use your degree. Did I answer the question? Yes, yes. Um, okay. We don't have the answer for the cure for cancer. That will be the next webinar. So we'll ask you all that one on the next webinar. All right, thank you so very much. That was very insightful and very helpful. Um, and uh, now we have Dr. Harris. We have a couple of questions for you. We're kind of combining these from the chat to try to give, um, to kind of maybe some of your answers might kind of uh, overlap. But, um, I, you know, Dr. Harris, you did mention that, you know, you know, you did speak about in your scope of the field about the difference between register, a nurse and a nurse practitioner. But um, would you mind going a little bit uh, more deep into like, uh, practical, you know, what practically what would a ner registered nurse do versus a nurse practitioner, like, you know, in the clinical setting? Um, and more specifically, does a nurse practitioner have as much bedside and caretaker work as a registered nurse? Um, and then uh, uh, afterwards, I'll have these other questions lined up too. It's like, how long are jo job shadows for nursing? And is it possible to, uh, to study abroad while becoming a nurse practitioner? And we're not asking for a cure for cancer, but I have <laughs> <laughs> Which ones do you think are the most important? All right, so let me see if I can answer these. So a registered nurse um, typically is, are, are like what you've been seeing on the news. People are taking care of patients at the bedside, providing day, um, bedside care. In a physician's office, they may be doing telephone triage, giving shots, giving immunizations, um, providing patient education. So those are kind of the scope of fields for a registered nurse. An advanced practice nurse, somebody like me, um, as a women's health nurse practitioner, I um, see, I have my own panel of patients, which I see um, myself or I manage and take care of myself. So I may d diagnose and prescribe um, and treat patients. I provide patient education, um, do health teaching and coaching. Those are kind of one-to-one, -one kind of I have my own panel of patients. So those are the, the major differences. Of course, in the field of nursing and advanced practice nurses, they work across all sorts of specialties. Some are in the hospitals. They could be rounding on a team with physicians, PAs, um, pharmacists, those type of things. As a nurse practitioner, they may be managing patient care and patient in a hospital. Um, outpatient is more one-to-one. -one. Um, you asked me about, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, I'm sorry, I lost all the questions. I the question for you. Yes, please. And, and I put it in the chat for you as well, so. Uh, yeah, so. Um, um, it's how long was job nurses. shadows? Sorry. Um, so um, a nurse practitioner in general does not sign, um, provide the same level of bedside nursing care as a registered nurse. Um, we manage care, so we're a little bit more removed. Um, from managing the day-to-day -day kind of taking care of the patient in the hospital. We don't typically say that you shadow um, people in advance of nursing school. Um, people have gone in and spent some time with nurses to see how, um, what nurses do, what, what their scope of operations and things are, but there's not a requirement to do that to apply to nursing school. Once you are in the nursing um, educational process, depending on, we are required to do clinical hours. So each course has a set number of clinical hours they have to do, typically about eight hours a week. If you're an advanced practice nurse, then um, depending on the specialty that you choose, you would have to do, in addition to your didactic work, between 500 and 600 clinical hours over the course of the specialty. Um, and, um, to study abroad, there are lots of programs that um, 
undergraduate programs in nursing school a little bit diff difficult to study abroad, but lots of students go um, participate in um, programs during um, their college um, pro pro programs that allow them to go on spring break and do um, immersion trips or take care of patients in remote settings and things like that. So there's a, those are specific programs. A lot of nursing schools now do have programs I can talk about our program at Boston College where they um, have a summer abroad program where they bring students from Chile, um, Switzerland, and um, a different uh, um, other schools together and they learn about the health systems in those um, particular countries. They may not necessarily take care of patients, but they learn about how health is provided in those countries. So um, it really does vary upon depending on the schools and where you are in the country. Um, other things, so what people mention a centralized nursing um, admission process, um, um, specialty process nursing doesn't have that. So each school has their own admission process. Um, so that's one thing that's different about nursing. All right, I think I've answered everything. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Through, you know, through a lot of uh, questions that you and um, these questions are coming in fast and furious from our audience. And so thank you for uh, your kindness and generosity of like, uh, trying to answer as many of these as possible. Um, and again, now we're going to go back down uh, alphabetical order after Dr. Harris. Um, just uh, quickly, we, there was a question that um, we want to quickly touch upon is that what are some common obstacles in professional school, in, in your specific professional school, and what are the best ways to overcome that, um, overcome, overcome those obstacles? So uh, Dr. Townsend, would you mind uh, taking this on? And we'll end with uh, Dr. Harris at the end. Okay, I'm off now, I'm mute. Um, can you repeat the question so I make sure to get it right? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let me go back to it right here. What are common obstacles in professional school and what are the best ways to overcome them? And so specific to your professional school. That's a great question. So I can certainly answer that for, for physical therapy. I think once, once our students are in, into physical therapy school um, and we at the, at the IHP, we have, I think fantastic resources for supporting students once they're here. Um, we're continuing to prove, improve those all the time because we get feedback from students saying, this was sufficient, but this wasn't sufficient. But the biggest, I think, um, the biggest thing that our students have to learn is to be proactive and access the resources that are available to them. Um, we have tutors, we have a, an academic support counselor, we have peer support groups. Um, we encourage our students to work and study in teams. We try to give them a week-long orientation that gives them all the tips and tools that they need to be successful. And the one thing when, of this, for the students I'm advising that I go back to again and again and again is being proactive when they're realizing that they're having difficulties and not being afraid to reach out for the, to, and to access the supports that are available to them. That's the best advice I have. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And thanks um, for your succinct answer on that. And that's very helpful for our students. Um, now we have Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos. Could you mention, um, talk about uh, the same, answer the same question. What are some common obstacles in professional school and what are the best ways to overcome them, particularly for dental school? Well, I think some common um, obstacles are uh, that it's a, the programs are very rigorous and you can get worn down over time. Um, it's really important, it sounds, um, uh, you know, a common advice, but to get good sleep, to eat well, to exercise, and increasingly to pay attention to your mental health. Um, I think developing anxiety and depression can be very common when you're, when you're stretched very thin and trying to accomplish a lot. Um, so, and make sure to reach out for help if you need it. Um, there's generally um, a lot of different resources available for students. And, um, Hopefully you'll do fine. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, and and now, uh, would you mind, um, uh, Miss Mary Warner? Would you mind uh, commenting on that question about what are the common obstacles in professional school, and the best way to overcome them? Sure. Um, so can you hear me? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I think that um, the volume of material that you have to learn is often overwhelming. 
And so what I recommend in the first year is that students um, try very hard to organize themselves and use their time effectively. Um, and that requires them to think about the balance of what is it that you need to focus on and what you need to study. And it takes a long time to learn how to decide what is important. And, and yet you have to do that because no patient comes in and tells you, <clears throat> I'm having a heart attack in my LAD and please would you t send me to the cath lab. They come in and say, oh, I'm not feeling well. I feel nauseated. I have some chest pain. It's radiating to my arm. And you have to figure out which of those things that I just mentioned are really important. So that's one of the most difficult challenges I think that some students have. Um, I think the that it's easy to get worn down, um, as was mentioned before, and taking care of yourself, sleeping, eating. I always recommend that you go to the movies once a week. Um, and in some cases, I tell the students they have to show me the ticket that they bought um, because I don't think they're doing that. Um, and I also recommend that you study in groups because you learn a lot from each other and you also learn what you know. And if you can teach other people what you know, then you really know the material very well. Um, so we always say when you go on the clinical rotations that um, make sure that you eat properly and not junk food, that you get enough sleep, and that you're nice to the nurses. And so that's how I'll end. Great answer. So all you uh, students out there, make sure you go to the movies when you get into professional school once a week. Be, you know, eat well so you can get your rest and be nice to the nurses and everyone around you. That's always uh, helps a lot. Thank you very much for your, your candid answer, uh, Ms. Warner. Really appreciate that. And now, David, uh, Dr. Uh, Zagarek, would you mind commenting on uh, pharmacy? What are the com some of the common obstacles in pharmacy school, and what are the best ways to overcome them? Uh, I'll, I'll reiterate that last comment. You have to be nice to the nurses. Any pharmacist will tell you you have to be nice <laughs> to the nurses. Um, you know, I think one of the things about going through pharmacy school, like all of our programs, all of our professional programs, um, they're, they're difficult programs. And at the same time, we have high standards and the people we let into our programs are incredibly capable. You know, we, we have very, very bright students that come to our programs that, that have the ability to succeed. We wouldn't let them into our programs if we didn't think they had the ability to succeed. So, so starting with you know, having a little confidence in yourself and knowing that if you're here, it's because, you know, we're not trying to weed you out. We're, we want you to be successful. We, we know you can be successful. Um, like other people have touched on, I, I think one of the most difficult challenges as you're going through a professional program like pharmacy is life happens. And, and we have to be able to balance what happens in our families and, and the other aspects of our life with, with the challenges, of course, of going through a professional school. Um, something that may be a little bit unique to pharmacy, but I know isn't entirely unique to people that are going into, into the health professions, is many of our students work while they're going to pharmacy school. As a matter of fact, you know, many of our students will, let's say, get a job in a pharmacy as a pharmacy technician while they are going to pharmacy school. And on one hand, it's a great way to be able to apply those things that you're learning in the classroom and be able to see how they're, how they're used in the field and at, at the same time make some money that you can support yourselves and support your education. I think the challenge, of course, for, for some of our students is again, achieving that balance. You know, it's one thing to pick up, let's say, you know, five to 10 to 15 hours a week and be able to use that to, to balance it. All of a sudden, if you're being asked to start picking up more and more hours, as you can imagine, it gets more and more difficult to be able to strike that balance with what you need to focus on, on getting your education and getting your degree with, with trying to balance with work. Um, there's no one single right answer. Um, and then I'll just close by going back to the point that, that Elise made, uh, Dr. Tonson made about um, being proactive. Uh, there are so many cases where students, we, we see them in difficulties and we have resources. We can help them. We can help make the adjustments if we have to, particularly as students that are going through difficult times. Um, but in order for that to happen, it does, it's incumbent on the student letting us know. We're not 
necessarily going to tap you on the shoulder and saying, hey, do you need to reschedule that exam? Or hey, do you need to you know, take another class or take this class on another time and so forth? Um, you know, we need you to be able to come forward and say, there are some challenges in my life. I, I need some help. And then, and then we can provide that help. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Zagari. And um, also, we, uh, we uh, started after Dr. Harris for this round of questions, but, but it, I think it dovetails perfectly because the last two great panelists mentioned that we need to be nice to our nurses. So we're going back to uh, Dr. Harris. Um, could you comment on what are the common obstacles in, uh, in, in professional school for nursing and what are the best ways to overcome them? Um, okay, so I can echo everything that everybody said before about looking for help, um, using, you know, your resources and things like that. The other things I, um, I, I do want to add, one of the common obstacles for people that are coming from another profession, maybe history or something like that, into a medical profession, that this is very scientific-based learning. And some, sometimes people have a hard time making that transition right, into the sciences. So, you know, that can be challenging for people, so they should seek help for that. Um, if you are a registered nurse now going into graduate school, you're going, as a nurse practitioner, you're going from taking orders from somebody now to giving orders. And sometimes people have a hard tra um, um, time transitioning to the, being the one who's making decisions about patient care. So that can be an obstacle. Um, and um, I would say that um, people need to learn to, the organization is definitely a big key. Also, another thing that people um, um, have a, are challenging to um, individuals is that we have people that are really good with their academic work, but going to clinical can be a challenge for them. Um, and so learning how to interact with patients, how to talk to patients um, and, and listening to patients um, can be a challenge for some people. Um, what we often say to people is you can get straight A's in your didactic work, but if you can't pass clinical, <laughs> then you're not going to be able to move on. And that speaks for everybody across the board, I, I would say that. So I would tell you to, if you're having um, problems or challenges in your clinical courses, to seek out help from your professors, um, to ask other individuals how they um, work through nursing school it's, um, a, um, or any other health professional schools. It's a very different mindset than other professions. Um, and so I would say those are the kind of biggest obstacles, but I definitely echo er everything that everybody else has said about seeking resources and care and taking care of yourself. Thank you so very much, Dr. Harris. Really appreciate uh, your, your thoughtful response. Um, now this question, a specific question for uh, Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos. I have a question. Um, BSCP is affiliated with uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, and, but, you know, we had this question. It says, what makes uh, you sure to land an interview? Or what can you do to land an interview at a prestigious school like Harvard? And so it doesn't have to be specific for Harvard, but, you know, one of the higher ranking schools. Um, sure. what, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, is that important? Whether it's the ranking, is that important as well? Could you mention on that any dental school versus the ranking? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Troy Patrakos. Of course. Um, I probably won't speak too much about Harvard specifically because the class is the smallest in the country with 35, and I'm sure there's many students that would do just fine the program, many more than we can um, interview and, and admit. Um, but generally, I, I would think at the more prestigious dental schools, um, having a, a perfect GPA by itself isn't enough. Um, we're really looking for well-rounded applicants who have soft skills, um, good soft skills, who um, demonstrate empathy, um, and um, you have a desire to, to work with people. It's really a customer service profession when it comes down to it. And you have to be able to connect with people, all different types of people. I also think that um, coming across as down to earth and authentic and um, the essay uh, really helps us to um, get a sense of, of who you are. And uh, leadership is, is also another important component that um, I'm sure uh, we look at and I'm sure other schools do as well, because we're looking for um, students who are going to advance, advance, the, um, advance the profession and who are interested in the science behind dentistry. Um, does that answer? That's great, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, and also um, we have a question now 
that uh, just a specific question for uh, Dr. Harris um, about the DNP versus master's program. Uh, Dr. Harris, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify that. So for um, the nursing um, profession is moving from a master's degree to be a nurse practitioner to a doctorate of nursing practice. It's moving to a clinical doctorate elect the other specialties. So there are a number of programs across the country that still offer master's degrees. Um, and those programs are okay. But what I can tell you is that the accrediting bodies are moving towards a doctorate of nursing practice by the year 2025. So the School of Anesthesia Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist programs, um, those students entering those programs will be entering into Doctor of Nursing Practice programs in 2021. So I would say people that are graduating with master's degrees are okay now, but eventually if you're three and four years out uh, or thinking along those lines, the programs that you might wanna think about are Doctor of Nursing Practice programs. That's what you will need to be able to sit for the certifying the exams. So everybody that has a master's now will be grandfathered in, meaning they won't need to return back to school. But if you let your license lapse in that time, you may have to return to school. So you just want to be mindful um, about which nursing programs that you're looking at now as you're thinking about entering school. So if it's two or three years away, then you want, might want to think about doctorate of nursing practice programs. So I just wanted to make sure I clarify that for everyone. Thank, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Harris. And, and we have um, a, a, a more of a question about uh, how is the equality in the workplace like in the careers um, between coworkers or even between patients racially and gender wise? Um, and how has this affected your work? And so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Elise Townsend um, to, to answer this question. and. We'll probably uh, uh, ask also Dr. Mary Warner and Dr. Z David Zagarek. But first, Dr. Townsend, could you touch upon, upon this, please? Sure. Well, my, you know, my experience in the workplace as a white woman has been different than other people's experiences in the workplace. But what I can say is, you know, every week is ongoing education about things that we need to know about as healthcare providers, like inequities in healthcare and racial disparities and, you know, how to communicate with people that speak any of a number of different languages and come from any number of different cultures. My clinical practice right now overlaps with research and that's at Massachusetts General Hospital. And as you can imagine, you name the language, you name the culture, I see them. I take care of children with rare muscle diseases that affect all races, genders, and ethnicities <laughs> equally. So. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer to how has that affected me in the workplace, but what I can say is what I'm learning is from my patients and my colleagues, and I'm learning every day. Um, and it's just sort of a, a, one of many aspects of lifelong learning that, that, you know, that I accept as part of my role as a health professional. Sometimes it's hard. It's not always pretty. You learn the hard way. You make mistakes. You apologize. You learn something new, and then you try again. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Doctor. I mean, Miss Mary Warner, would you mind commenting on that as well? Sure. I was trying to think of um, some good examples. Um, I would say that personally, as a woman um, in the PA profession, while um, during the, the my lifetime as a PA. Um, I, uh, we, the PA profession is now more women than men. That transition occurred probably 10 or 12 years ago, maybe 15 now, I'm losing track of time. Um, but um, at the beginning, um, I know that I was the only woman PA in several um, areas and, and certainly in orthopedic surgery, I was the only woman PA. And um, I definitely experienced times where um, I felt like I was um, not treated equally. Um, as an example, when I became pregnant, people asked me, um, people being the male colleagues, um, you know, now that you're pregnant, are you going to stop work um, because you're pregnant? And, you know, I'm not sure that you can do this job if you're pregnant. Um, so just to let you know, I worked to the last, very last day and I delivered the next day in both cases, <laughs> um, <laughs> so just to prove a point. Um, and my estrogen levels were pretty high while I was pregnant too. So I reminded people that they said that to me just to prove a point. But I would say that 
um, trying very hard um, to provide care um, with people or for people with people from different backgrounds one needs to think about how are you going to approach this because even if you're hispanic as i am i don't know every single hispanic culture and i don't speak spanish well enough to communicate this was my my family's um, heritage um, and we kept some traditions and we didn't have other traditions and in certain cases um, when um, i was seeing a patient i wasn't really sure what, how I should approach. They're from Africa. I don't know anyone from Africa, so I'm not sure what to say. And so one of the approaches that I always used at the bedside was asking very open-ended questions. Like, for example, um, if I was trying to get a history of their exercise or diet, can you just tell me what your day is like and let the patient tell you the story so that you can try to help meet them where they are and figure out that if they have special needs related to their diet while they're in, in the hospital because they keep a kosher diet and they also um, you know, keep um, uh, Sab uh, Sabbath as, as holy, um, they're orthodox, for example, you have to provide them access to meals in a certain way. And so just being open and inquisitive to ask how is it that you live your life so that you can understand that and i think that that is a very good approach now sometimes we make mistakes and we um, presume that people are a certain thing that they're not um, and whatever that means i think that you know because you came in dressed a certain way um, that maybe you don't have any money, or maybe I think that you're dressed a certain way and you have lots of money, and all of those sort of preconceived notions are wrong. Um, so if that happens, which it certainly has happened to me on occasion, not often, but um, you know, you have to be very humble and say, I'm really sorry, I was, um, you know, I, I should have asked you instead of presumed something. And I think that that's one of the ways that we can improve our communication skills with people who are different from we are, because we're all different from each other in one way or the other. And I think that, that if, you, if you engender trust with your patient, no matter what the situation is, um, they will um, teach you what you need to know to take care of them well. But you have to be able to listen to them and and you have to really come from a place where you're not telling them what to do you're asking them what is it that they would like to do and just giving them um consultation so that's my brief answer thank, thank you so much uh miss warner really appreciate that uh dr zagari were you also commenting on were you might com commenting on how is the equality in the workplace and in the and pharmacy between co-workers and patients and racially and gender wise um, and if so, how has it affected your work? And then we'll also have Dr. Harris comment on this afterwards, and then we'll go to our final round of uh, one minute uh, closing thoughts. Certainly, thank you so much. When I reflect on pharmacy and ph how pharmacy education, one of the things that comes to my mind right away is how much things have changed since I went to pharmacy school. When I went to pharmacy school, I have to say, most of my classmates looked like me. Um, and that was in the 1980s. Um, you know, 30 plus years later, we now are to the point where um, almost two thirds of our students in a doctor of pharmacy program are female. And in particular, in our program at Northeastern, um, well more than 50% of our students are non-white. Um, we have come a long way in pharmacy as a profession with respect to especially gender equity, especially on matters like compensation and pay matters. Uh, research, and this is actually one of my areas of research, uh, looking at workforce matters, and we found that, that pharmacy um, and ph women pharmacists get paid essentially at the same level that their male colleagues do, and so we've come a long ways there. Um, I, I think there still is a lot that we have to learn and a lot of work that we have to do, um, particularly about making sure that we are providing those same type of opportunities, not just to women, but to people from other backgrounds as well, recognizing the challenges that um, people have in pursuing an education and a degree in a, in, in a pharmacy program. And, and recognizing that what we have to learn, like some of the others have shared about our patients, um, even if you're not 
from necessarily somebody else's background. We have a lot to learn about them. In order to take good care of people, we have to meet people where they are and learn what their needs are and, um, and do that in a very mindful way. And that, and for many of us, starts in our educational programs. We, we as educators have to work with our students to be able to get them to be able to effectively meet people where they are. And um, that's something I remind myself of every day. Yes, thank you so much for your, your very uh, succinct answer and, and thoughtful answer, Dr. Segari. Um, and then also we just want to have um, Dr. Harris briefly comment on this before we go to our final one minute round of questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Harris, would you mind commenting on the equality in the workplace between coworkers and patients racially and gender wise, and if it's impacted your work, and if you could briefly touch on how can healthcare professionals address healthcare disparities? Oh, that was a big one. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I can echo some of the things that the other participants have, panelists have said. Um, I do think that we need to have open and honest communication in general. What I found is that people are just generally seeking help. And if you're open, willing to listen, learn, and ask lots of questions, they're more than happy to meet you where they are. I think that um, in nursing is largely a female profession. Um, we are definitely seeking more men in the profession. I think that would do us a world of good. We're open to having more men in the profession. Um, so I encourage men to apply to nursing and nursing school. Um, I think that um, the quality of work in the workplace, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on both sides that we need to, and that we as nurses need to, or healthcare professionals need to understand our patients and the patients need to understand where we are as healthcare professionals. Um, and we both need to be open and listen to each other really well, right? That's the only way we, that we can learn from each other. It's a, it's a give and take relationship and we want it to be honest and frank um, and helpful for each other. So I'd say that um, there's a lot of work to be done in the healthcare environment, but we're all open and willing and, um, to learn from each other. Um, Thank you so very much. It's very, very helpful. Um, and then also, um, we have the lightning round of questions now for final closing thoughts. So we have time for one last question for panelists. If you give, um, and within a minute or less, um, it would be great for each panelist to give one clear final thought to the audience. As we understand that these are trying times, but can we provide the students a message of hope and how best to maintain their resiliency and continue to work towards the goal of becoming a healthcare professional? Um, and this one will start with uh, Dr. Townsend and then we'll go through alphabetical and end with Dr. Harris. Sure, I can speak um, for certainly the health professions programs at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. In the last handful of years, you know, addressing accessibility of our programs for students from all backgrounds has been at the top of the priority list. We're doing better. We're not doing as well as we'd like to be, um, but you know, events that are happening around us now, I just sat in a, an hour long faculty meeting today where the topic of conversation was, how can we do better teaching our students about health disparities and how can we do better, you know, serving our students of color and our st students from diverse backgrounds. And so what I can say is I've been in this profession for 15 years and it's at the top of the conversation level like it never has been before. And I see that as a big sign of hope and promise for, um, for, for making the health professions. What we want is for the health professions to reflect the diversity of our society. And it's, you know, I've been in admissions for over 10 years and it's only been in the last couple of years that I look out at our class of 70 new students and say, finally, this starts to look like the patients that I'm seeing at the hospitals. And so that to me is a message of hope. Thank you so much uh, for your, your succinct answer, Dr. Townsend. Uh, Ms. Sarah Troy Petrakos, would you mind uh, briefly commenting in about 45 seconds uh, to a minute about this as well? Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, you found the right profession when um, a light bulb goes off, you have sort of an aha moment, and uh, you find that you feel really passionate about your, your prospective career. Um, set realistic goals for, but for yourself by, um, you know, review the incoming uh, profiles of, uh, of classes to find out if, uh, you know, you're within range. 
Um, but be gentle with yourself during these unprecedented times. There's a lot going on. This uh, level of uncertainty makes um, probably stressful process even more stressful in applying to professional school. Um, and it's a long process. Um, take it and break it down into manageable pieces um, that you can work on over time. And um, if it doesn't work, uh, don't be afraid to try again. Great, thank you so very much. Um, and now, uh, could we have uh, Ms. Mary Warner come in as well? Sure. Um, so I think that we have, we as a society, but we as the medical profession, and I'm speaking for everyone on this panel and even physicians and so on, we have a moral obligation to address health disparities. Enough is enough. We, it's enough. And it's been enough for a very, very, very long time. And this is a golden moment that we have to break open some, uh, you know, just like in the example of using the web camera to have a patient visit, we have the opportunity to finally say, what are we going to do? And what are our steps to improve access to care, to improve social determinants of health, and to address the root causes of so many of these inequities. And I think that now we are at a groundswell level that there is a huge push by our society to say we want to change our society. And I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. I mean, I'm not that old. I mean, I guess I'm old now, but I'm not you know, <laughs> that old. And I feel like um, we have to take advantage of that and we have to keep pressing forward. And so you all, in my opinion, are the wave of the future and you are both gonna benefit from this and you're gonna help us fix this problem. Amen, yes, yes. All your attendant, uh, attendees and students, you are the future. And Dr. Zagarik, um, would you mind briefly commenting this in about 45 seconds to a minute? Certainly, certainly. I, you know, rather than repeat what everybody else said, something that I always remind others and I'll certainly remind myself of is that we really can't effectively take care of others, which is so much what we want to do in healthcare, unless we can also take care of ourselves. And I just recognize the importance as we're going through times like this and a process like this of taking the steps and doing the things that you need to to be able to take care of yourself. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's not selfish to take care of yourself, especially if our whole goal is so that we can better take care of others. And so as, as you go through this process of applying to medical school, going through the, the turbulent times that we're going through right now, do remember to, to take part in those self-care activities that are gonna help keep you, you. Great answer, Dr. Zagarik. Uh, Dr. Harris, would you mind briefly commenting as well on your closing thought? So I was just thinking that um, this is a process um, by which everybody can learn. So we should take the opportunity to listen to each other, to be mindful when things happen to us, to speak up about those, um, take the time to educate the other person about what they said, what happened, whatever, listen to it from both sides of the perspective. Um, and that's the only way that we can make change. This is, the t this is a time when we all should be proactively seeking solutions um, and pointing out disparities when they're missed by others. Thank you, thank you so very much. And that concludes our question and answers. Um, I do wanna make a special note is that if there were questions, you, you know, thank you for the students you asked so many great questions. We couldn't get to all of them today, but if there were questions that you really are burning and you want them answered and you didn't, we didn't get a chance to touch upon those, please email BSCP directly and the BSCP fantastic team will do their best to get that answer to you uh, at a later date. Um, but also I do wanna um, ask all the attendees to go to the poll once launched and to answer the poll questions. And this would be quite helpful for us, you know, for the BSCP team to um, get your answers for that. So please um, answer those poll questions. And then also, um, as, the, as a reminder, uh, we'd like to uh, remind everybody that this webinar is recorded and it will be on the BSCP website. So you can catch all the great things. If you're feverishly writing notes, you can uh, catch uh, 
you know, more and in depth, uh, everything that was said here. And so first I would like to thank, uh, close by thanking Dr. Joan Reed for her leadership during these troubling times and, and for spearheading uh, BSCP for decades and, and the work that she does in diversity. Uh, she makes, you know, America better every day uh, with her hard work. And also I'd like to thank the panelists, Dr. Alyssa Harris, Dr. Elise Townsend, uh, Ms. Sarah uh, Petroy Petrakos, Ms. Mary Warner, and Dr. David Zagarek. You guys did an incredible job. Thank you so very much. I'm, you know, I benefited from learning from you today, and I'm, I, I'm sure that our students also benefited from your responses as well. And also, uh, student, students, if you feel there's a question needed, please feel free they are amenable to reaching out to them if you want to email them or email the institution, and uh, you can contact uh, their institution for more information. But also, I do want to thank the BSCP staff, particularly Ms. Holly De Silva, uh, Ms. Kalia Noel Gibson, and Ahmed Azim for all of the hard work they did make this run so smoothly. And I would thank all you students and participants and BSCP family for joining us today. We know that you're quite busy, it's a quite troubling time, but choosing to spend an hour and a half with us, we are very grateful for that, and we're very honored to be able to share this time with you. And in closing, we just wish you a great and safe summer as we encourage you to practice social distancing and compassion for others. And please be nice to nurses, but be nice to everyone in the healthcare field and, in, uh, and everyone around you and to your families. And thank you, and this concludes our session. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>